Good morning, my name is Angela. I'm a third year. Um, this is your EM CCM lecture. Thank you to the CCM team, uh, especially Dr. DeSouza and Dr. Hennison. All right, this is the date today. Okay, so, uh, so you have a patient that arrives to triage. Um, they come by taxi. It, the month is February, it's in the evening. Um, they are triaged to the pod. She is a 44-year-old female. She is complaining of shortness of breath for a week. It's associated with kind of like viral syndrome type symptoms, fever, headache, chest pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and a cough. These are her vitals. Um, you notice that she is um, tachypnic, hypoxic, and febrile, but she is normal cardiac and has a normal blood pressure and a normal finger stick. So on your initial assessment, her airway is intact, she's talking, uh, she, her breathing is notable for tachypnea and some hypoxemia. Otherwise, her circulation is intact and she's neurologically intact. All right, so we're juniors. Can I get a preliminary problem list? It's hypoxemia, fever, tachypnea, nausea, vomiting, Diarrhea. All right. So uh, just some highlights. We've got dyspnea, chest pain, hypoxemia, hypoxia, and tachycardia and fever. So what are some initial interventions you want to start? Oxygen. What kind of oxygen do you want to use? Nasal cannula. Sounds like a good start. Anything else? Tylenol. So some kind of antipyretic. Uh, IVO2 monitor, all that good stuff. We will get there. All right, so she's initially placed on oxygen by nasal cannula. She's given albuterol times one. Uh, she, some normal saline boluses are initiated, and she's given uh, toradol, 15 milligrams, and an ECG is ordered. So some additional HPI. Uh, she, she's been having shortness of breath for one week. It started with dyspnea on exertion, but it's progressed to chest pain and dyspnea at rest. Her cough is productive of white sputum. She's been having three watery bowel movements a day. Her past medical history is only significant for a bariatric surgery. She takes some vitamins for her current illness. She's been taking some over-the-counter cold medications. Her daughter has been, uh, she's sick contact in her daughter, but otherwise has not had any travel. Her physical exam is really only notable for tachypnea, and she has some ronchi in the right base. But otherwise, the rest of her exam is unremarkable, as you see here. She's obese. She's not in any acute distress, except for some increased work of breathing. Um, she looks uh, mostly hydrated, heart is regular, belly soft. Uh, initial differential diagnoses. Pneumonia, myocarditis, nice, PE, yep, and flu, yep, it's February, so good thought. All right, so we've got pneumonia, and um, she is having cert meeting search criteria, so she could be having sepsis, pulmonary embolism, you could, um, acute heart failure syndrome, and ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So on reassessment, the patient is continuing to have a persistent hypoxia and increased work of breathing, so uh, high flow nasal cannula is initiated. Uh, ECG was, um, there's no record of one, so I do not have one for you to interpret. Uh, the rest of her ED core, she's uh, maintained on high flow nasal cannula. She's treated for community acquired pneumonia. Um, and. Uh, she's given uh, CAP antibiotics, and I'll show you the rest of her results. Uh, so what what do you want to do next? What's missing? Chest x-ray, labs, EKG. What kind of labs do you want to get? Sepsis labs. BBG? Okay. ABG. All right. Okay, so she gets uh, CBC, CMP, coags, uh, VBG, lactate, blood cultures, influenza, PCR, like Dr. Chow mentioned, and also the chest x-ray. So we'll show you the results. 
These are her labs. Um, what's the most interesting thing on her labs? So she's a little bit anemic and she's positive for the flu. And this is her chest x-ray. Um, Dr. Agenor, would you like to read the chest x-ray? Can you speak up, please? So looks like she's got some retrocardiac infiltrates. Um, and really, she has like patchy infiltrates bilaterally. So what is this concerning for? What is this clinical picture? What? AIDS. That's a good thought. What? Did you say? Oh, atypical pneumonia. Uh, so this is a multifocal pneumonia. Pulmonary edema is a thought. Um, all right, so here's our updated problem list. Our patient has influenza with multifocal pneumonia. It could be viral pneumonia or it could be superimposed pneumonia. Um, and she's also got sepsis with hypoxic respiratory insufficiency. So a few hours later, around 1140, the patient is uh, dispositioned to medicine. Uh, with diagnosis of multifocal pneumonia and influenza, and at this time she's on high flow nasal cannula in the pod. So on reassessment uh, around midnight, uh, she's noted to be persistently to uh, respirations in the 40s, increased work of breathing, and then her PF ratio. Um, so this is this is a uh, drawn by the ABG. It's the ratio of your uh, partial your pressure of uh, oxygen versus what FiO2 they're on. And this is di uh, helpful for diagnostic criteria for respiratory failure. So above or less than 300 is indica indicative of respiratory failure or ARDS. Um, mild would be 200 to 300 and then 100 to 200 is moderate. So initially she has a PF ratio of 371 with the values you see there. And then upon reassessment, uh, her PF ratio is 203, which is cons uh, consistent with mild ARDS. So BiPAP is initiated, critical care is consulted. And around this time, she's transferred to CCT and she, uh, her disposition is upgraded to the NICU. So we'll go over her ho hospital course later. Um, the couple of topics that I wanted to discuss, are, are there any questions about the case before I move on? Uh, there was no documented order of an EKG and via all of the ways that I know to look for EKGs that were done a year ago, I could not find one. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk about two big topics. First is hypoxemic respiratory failure, all our type 1 respiratory failure. We're going to talk about the physiology of it and then the specific role of that high flow nasal cannula in play in treating these patients. Um, and then we'll just touch more briefly on influenza, complications of it, specifically pneumonia, and I'll give some recommendations on antivirals. Okay, so for hypoxemic respiratory failure, um, how many types of respiratory failure are there? <coughs> Big buckets. We've got hypoxemic, it's not a trick question. Hypercapnic, so that would be type two respiratory failure. So the reason it's important to diagnose your patient appropriately. Certainly you can have a mixed picture, but the underlying physiology of each is different, so you have to treat the underlying physiology. So um, we're gonna talk about the physiology of hypoxemia, so try to turn on your med school brain for a little bit. Um, and the, but the purpose of understanding that physiology is so that you can know that what your interventions are doing to help under, uh, address the underlying pathophysiology. Um, and then we'll talk specifically about hypolonasal cannula. Um, so do you guys remember um, in respiratory physiology the five mechanisms of hypoxemia? Low FiO2, VQ mismatch, shunt, hypoventilation, diffusion impairment. Awesome. Very good. 
All right, so the reason this is important is because you treat each of those things differently. Um, obviously, most of these respond to supplemental oxygen. It, you know, if you're in the mountains and you, there's low uh, PI or in, uh, low partial pressure of inspiratory oxygen, then you can give supplemental oxygen. If you're a patient that's hypoventilating, um, they will respond to oxygen. These patients typically will um, have signs of hypercapnia. So it'll be pretty obvious um, who these patients are. They might have a history of obstructive lung disease um, and you know, physically you might notice that they're hypoventilating. So these patients need IPAP, they need, uh, they need ventil ventilatory support. Um, diffusion impairment, we don't really see as often. It's not really clinically as relevant. Um, so diffusion impairment means that there's something getting in the way of oxygen and CO2 diffusing across the barrier and uh, participating in gas exchange. The reason this isn't, most, this isn't usually relevant is that uh, a red blood cell takes about 0.75 seconds to transverse an alveoli, and gas exchange happens pretty much within the first 0.25 seconds um, for oxygen, and CO2 is even faster than that. So um, this usually isn't the underlying pathophysiology that you're treating. But examples of diffusion impairment would be anything that's uh, any kind of destruction, like thickening of the alveolar um, capillary interface or destruction. So that's things like interstitial lung disease or emphysema. So VQ mismatch and shunt are related. Shunt is just a very extreme form of VQ mismatch. So this is where your ventilation and your perfusion are not matched. In the normal lung, the v uh, VQ is 0.8. So you're going to have areas that are you know, better aerated, like the tops of your lungs, um, but your perfusion is not going to match perfectly one-to-one, -one, so normal is about 0.8. And VQ mismatch uh, responds to supplemental oxygen. But importantly, on the extreme form of VQ mismatch, you, if you have a shunt where you have an area that's getting no ventilation but is still perfusing, that area will not respond to supplemental oxygen. And what you really need to do to address an underlying shunt is to provide EPAP or PEEP. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So examples of um, diseases with VQ mismatch. Um, so these are... Um, so your shunt, uh, VQ mismatch is going to be like a PE where you have a portion of your lung uh, where you're not perfusing, um, but you're still getting the ventilate, some vent ventilation. And a shunt is zero ventilation, so this is things like pneumonia and ARDS, which is more relevant in our patient. Um, so just, to, just uh, to understand the physiology of PEEP, and then we'll be done with physiology, um, uh, it, so PEEP um, increases your functional residual capacities, which if you look at this graph, starting from the left side, um, you have your normal tidal breath, so this is a volume by t time curve. And your functional residual capacity is how much air you have in your lungs at the end of expiration. So if you think about it, this is the only air that your alveoli have to participate in gas exchange at the end uh, at, during expiration. So if you have a shunt physiology where your alveoli are filled with exudates or edema, um, or you're having alveolar collapse like you do in ARDS, then you're not, you're, your patient's going to be hypox, hypoxemic um, because there's not that amount of gas to participate in, uh, in gas exchange. So PEEP, by recruiting alveoli, um, reducing, like pushing the edema away and uh, opening up the collapsed alveoli, that effectively increases your functional residual capacity. So that's the mechanism that it helps you with hypoxia. hypoxia. All right, so now we're going to move on into uh, any questions about this. I know we all noticed that. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm supposed to cite the figures, and I don't know where this professor got it from. So. Um, OK, so we're going to talk about the different uh, delivery modes of oxygen. So this seems really small, but actually, this was really interesting to learn. Um, you know, Does everybody know how much FiO2 and how much flow you can deliver by the different tools available to us? Yes, no. So by conventional oxygen, you can deliver uh, FiO2 between 24 to 80%. So what is the FiO2 of room air? 21%, great. So obviously, we usually start out with nasal cannula. This can deliver FiO2 between 24 to 
Um, and then from that, you can progress to a simple mask. So this is exactly what it looks like. It's differentiated from a, a mask with a reservoir in that a mask with a reservoir can deliver a higher FiO2 because there are three one-way valves on the, um, on the mask. So let me back up. So the issue with conventional oxygen is that the delivery of FiO2 is very, um, you can't control it as well. So a normal person might be, have an inspiratory flow of 30 liters per, per minute. But um, I'll skip ahead to the next one. You can see that for conventional oxygen, the maximum amount of flow that you're going to get is 15 liters. So that means that the air that the patient is breathing is going to be diluted by room air. So it's just going to be um, hard, difficult to control how much, how much oxygen they're getting. Um, so anyway, back to the non-rebreather, uh, you have one-way valves there so that you can prevent dilution of the air that they're breathing with, um, with room air. And then the last thing on the bottom is a Venturi mask, which um, honestly I've never seen before. They have these um, specific FiO2 inserts and um, they use like Bernoulli's principle to be able to deliver high flow. So um, those are your ranges of uh, conventional oxygen and how much FiO2 you can deliver by those means. And then so the other thing that you want to think about the kind of oxygen delivery mechanism is based on how much flow you're getting. Nasal cannula, can del um, you can deliver between zero and, or one and six liters of flow. If you're giving above four liters of flow, you should consider humidifying the oxygen because um, it's uncomfortable. Um, between, uh, for a non-rebreather, you can deliver between six and 10 liters of flow. A simple face mask is between five and eight. And the Venturi mask, like I mentioned before, because they have these uh, unique inserts, you can deliver between three and 15 liters of flow. So high flow nasal cannula is kind of a step above this. You can deliver between 30 and 60 liters of flow. Um, this is a basic setup for high flow nasal cannula. You have the, the nasal mask, you have a humidifier, oxygen blender, and then your flow meter. So what are the advantages of high flow nasal cannula? So the FiO2, you can get more stable delivery. You, get, you can have um, what they call dead space washout because the flow is so great um, that you're basically flushing out some of the CO2 in the large airways um, the, in your anatomic dead space. And because the flow is so high, you can achieve peeps between three and seven. Um, and this peep is enhanced if you can close the circuit by having the patient close their mouth. And then there are some other perks that shouldn't be overlooked. It's um, humidified air. If anybody has ever tried to put on a BiPAP or nasal cannula or anything, it's actually kind of uncomfortable to have dry air blowing in your face. Um, high flow nasal cannula allows mo the patient more mobility. It's more comfortable and the patient can take PO. This is just an image of the areas of um, dead space uh, washout that you can achieve with high flow nasal cannula. Are there any questions about that? Okay, so next we're just going to review a couple of studies um, with the question in mind of, well, so if I put my patient in a high flow nasal cannula, is that really going to reverse their current physiology and prevent an intubation? Um, so there are a lot of reviews about respiratory failure and high flow nasal cannula. I think if you are going to search this literature yourself, just be aware, like we mentioned before, that it's really important to differentiate between type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure. So a lot of these studies, they have like undifferentiated respiratory failure. So you're looking at outcomes in a mixed population. But if you believe in physiology, then maybe you should probably treat patients differently based on what their primary problem is. So this is a great uh, study by the Florali group. Um, high, flow high flow oxygen through nasal cannula and acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. They were very strict about their inclusion criteria in terms of what types of respiratory um, failure they put in the study, and in addition, it is a prospective randomized control trial. So it's a multi-center, was randomized, done in France and Belgium. The primary outcome was looking at intubation at 28 days, and those are your secondary outcomes that you see there. So looking at the florality inclusion criteria, our patient uh, very much fits this. Uh, she was over 18 years old. Her PF ratio was about 200 when she was upgraded. She's not hypercapnic, so this is the point I was making before about um, looking at outcomes in pure hypoxemic respiratory failure, and she doesn't have any underlying lung disease. 
They had three treatment groups providing standard um, oxygen via a non rebreather, high flow nasal cannula, or um, non invasive ventilation, basically CPAP. So, um, any difference in the rate and intubation rates, there was not one detected. Um, you can see the percentage of patients that were intubated ranged from 38% to 50, but um, this finding was not, signif not significant. Um, they recruited uh, about 300 patients overall, which was adequate to power their study. Um, and then just briefly looking at the mortality, um, the mortality was lowest in the high-flow na nasal cannula group um, for in ICU and at 90 days mortality. They do mention that this could be limited because uh, just the intubation overall rate, you can see is 40%, is overall lower. So some of this could be confounded by that. Um, so one other interesting consideration, right now overall, it doesn't seem like we have enough data to really say if um, high flow nasal cannula can you know, prevent intubation. But just an, an important clinical consideration is um, don't let your non-invasive ventilation, um, you know, trick you into delaying uh, providing definitive treatment for a patient. If your patient needs to be intubated, um, you know, don't delay and temporize with non-invasive ventilation. And here's a study where you can't draw any, you know, solid conclusions because it's retrospective, um, but it's just some food for thought. Um, in, in this study, they found that failure of high-flow nasal cannula was associated um, and delaying intubation was associated with increased mortality. So they looked at groups of patients that failed high flow nasal cannula and those that failed it within 48 hours and were early intubated versus those that were intubated after 48 hours. Um, and the, they demonstrated an odds ratio of 0 0.369. And this NNT is, uh, you just have to trust the math that I did. I made some assumptions about baseline mortality, but if you take that odds ratio, um, that could give you an NNT between like 2 and 30. So that's saying like if you do early intubation instead of late intubation, then maybe you could, if you do it, you know, for 2 to 30 patients, you could save one, one, more, uh, one life. So I think that's, that's pretty good. But obviously, we need to study this more. Um, any questions about those two studies? All right, so last thing about high-flow nasal cannula is, you know, what are you going to do when your patient comes and you want to put them on high-flow nasal cannula? You need to titrate the flow and the FiO2. So the flow, you should start at 30 liters per minute for an adult. It doesn't make any sense to go lower than that because their baseline inspiratory flow is going to be 30 liters per minute. And then you can titrate it up 10 to 15 liters every uh, 15 minutes, and the max is 60 liters. Um, for peds, you can do uh, between 5 and 20 liters. There's tables that you can look up, um, but this is just a number that I personally am going to remember. So if you have a neonate that's like 3 kgs, you can start at 5, and then up to 40 kgs, you can go to 20, and then everyone else is kind of in between. And then titrate your FiO2 to uh, O2 saturation to like 90, 92%. Yep. Yeah, because after that, then you start getting at flows of 25 to 30, so you might as well just think of them like an adult. So just uh, some take-home points from our first section about hy hypoxemic failure. Um, make sure that you're treating the correct physiology. Think about whether your patient has hypoxemic versus hypercapnic physiology. So this means when you see a patient that's hypoxic and they're having an increased work of breathing, our reflex tends to be to call respiratory and ask them to start BiPAP at 10 over 5, but maybe your patient could benefit from high-flow nasal cannula um, or you could just provide um, CPAP. Um, make sure that you're oxygenating by titrating your FiO2 and PEEP um, and, and providing PEEP if the patient needs it. And just remember your conventional oxygen can deliver up to 15 liters of flow and 80% um, FiO2. And then high flow nasal cannula, maybe think about this as one of your first lines for non-invasive ventilation for hypoxemic respiratory failure. It gives you stable FiO2 delivery. It uh, delivers a little bit of PEEP and it's more comfortable for the patient. So far we're seeing that it doesn't really affect intubation rates. And just remember your titration um, parameters there. And uh, make sure you're always reassessing your patient and don't delay intubation if you need it. Yes? Um, 
like upstairs? Yeah. I think so. I think you just have to call rest return. No? Oh, you know what? I think the problem is that you that you can't get enough, the yeah the tank because the flow is so so high. Flores? Oh, it's like it's um by increasing the flow. Yeah. Um, and then is there so would you say that uh, having those pre existing ADRs is just keeping things in the present? No. Yeah. Any other questions? What is the what? Oh, that's just that's the FIO two thing. Yes. Um, so it's just some brief things about influenza. Um, so for influenza, you can have viral shedding, but one day before symptom onset, um, up to five days in adult and in germy children, they can have viral shedding for uh, like ten days or more. So some of the complications you can see with influenza are pneumonia, ARDS, as in our patients. Um, there are non-pulmonary complications, but these are rare. These are things like encephalitis, myocarditis, um, myositis, and rhabdo. In children, you can see uh, otitis media and then lower respiratory infections like croup, bronchiolitis, and pneumonia. At peak flu season, about 50% of hospitalizations are, in children are t linked to or influenza-related lower respiratory tract infections. Um, just some numbers for this year. The CDC estimates that there have been 22 million flu illnesses and 210 hospitalizations and 12,000 deaths. So focusing in on pneumonia and influenza, there's kind of three big categories. Um, you've got primary viral. This tends to happen within the first day, and people get sick really quickly. But then for bacterial infection, it needs time to develop. So most uh, you can have a mixed viral bacterial picture, or you can have a bac secondary bacterial pneumonia. You should think about that when, as like a second sickening, where you have a patient who had uh, influenza or flu-like illness, but then they recovered, and then they later developed signs of pneumonia. Uh, the difficulty with diagnosing pneumonia it, in influenza and just in general is that you know you're not going to get um, you're not going to get definitive diagnosis and a lot of the studies that look at pneumonia and influenza they have very um, heterogeneous criteria for what constitutes pneumonia and you're not going to be doing a bronchial wash on every patient so you know it's difficult to differentiate if it really is bacterial um, so these are at-risk populations for complications, um, which I'm not going to read to you because my brother, who's an undergrad, was able to guess most of these, so I think that you guys know them as well. Um, these are some of the reasons that you might want to treat a patient to increase the duration of their, or decrease the duration of their symptoms, prevent complications, um, decrease transmission. Um, so if you have an index patient that gets infected, um, you don't want them to be infecting little neonates at home or maybe old elderly or immunocompromised people. And theoretically, you would like to treat to decrease mortality. So if we look at the results from a Cochrane review about some of these things <clears throat> on how our antivirals are performing, it decreases uh, duration of symptoms from about 0.7 to 1.2 days. It was like 17 hours in adults and 29 hours in children. Um, you do see some decrease in bronchitis, um, but I guess I don't know if you really care that much about bronchitis. Um, <laughs> for pneumonia, the NNT uh, was calculated as 100, but like I mentioned before, there's some uncertainty here because the diagnostic criteria for pneumonia in a lot of these studies was very heterogeneous, so it's difficult to know what conclusion to draw. Um, there's no evidence that it decreases hospitalizations. Does it decrease transmission? Um, there's one really interesting study that was done in Bangladesh as a randomized placebo-controlled double-blinded, um, which I don't think we could ever achieve here, but they monitored an entire population of people for any respiratory symptoms, and then they would send like a public health worker to go flu swab them, and then if they were positive for flu, they would give them placebo or, um, or antiviral. 
And in that study, they showed that um, secondary illness from the, uh, from the household members was decreased in people that were treated. The only issue with that is that only 37% of the household members submitted to flu testing. So it's unclear that those secondary illnesses were actually influenza. Um, so mortality, all the studies are underpowered to comment on that. So obviously we have to balance that with our harms and the main harms um, are GI symptoms. So for nausea and vomiting, uh, number needed to harm is 20 and then you also have your psych and renal uh, complications to consider. So some take home points for influenza. Uh, suspect pneumonia when you have a rapid uh, illness or second sickening. But remember that it's difficult to differentiate viral versus bacterial, so just use your clinical judgment as to whether or not to cover for CAP. And you, uh, I would recommend that you treat at-risk populations critically ill because they're so sick anyway. Um, and it's not unreasonable to treat to decrease transmission. All others uh, either just don't treat them or you could have shared decision making with the patient. Um, any questions about that? That's the end of the content. All right, cool. So um, the rest of the hospital course for our patient um, is actually quite impressive for someone who has no medical problem. She had a very prolonged ICU course. She was maintained on BiPAP for three days. She developed an AKI, was given all of the antibiotics you see there. On day three, they decided she wasn't responding to BiPAP, so she was intubated on PRVC. After five days, her antibiotics were discontinued. Um, her mode was changed to APRV or bivent um, to treat her ARDS, and that was titrated down to pressure control. Um, she developed a leukocytosis, and her um, aspirates came back with a positive MRSA, so vancomycin was restarted. She was extubated, uh, but she failed that on day 14 and was reintubated. Steroids were initiated. ET tube was dislodged and replaced. Finally, at day 19, after 16 days of intubation, she was extubated, downgraded to medicine, and discharged home. Um, so some interesting things about her hospital course to relate to some of the things we've talked about. You can see this patient was intubated at day three. Um, obviously, she overall had a good outcome. Um, you know, she came back to the ER for unrelated complaints later. But uh, would her days on the ventilator have been less or her risk of mortality been less if she had been intubated earlier than 48 hours? Um, and then, obviously, the antibiotic treatments to consider. Um, and that's pretty much it. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Yeah.